Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is titled Monitoring AAV DNA Release and Capsid Stability Using Light Scattering. My name is Matt Willard, and I'm the Marketing Director over here at Yokogawa Fluence Analytics. Our company, which was named as a top 50 global advanced manufacturing startup by CB Insights, provides patented process analytics and control solutions to polymer and biopharmaceutical companies worldwide. And in January of 2023, our startup was acquired by Yokogawa Electric Corporation. So we are now proud to be a part of the Yokogawa family. We have two product lines. One is called ACOMP and it serves the polymer industry by providing continuous real-time measurements on critical polymer properties during production. The other is called Argen and it serves the biopharmaceutical industry. Argen is a static light scattering instrument that can independently measure the stability of multiple biopolymer samples under thermal, chemical, and mechanical stress in parallel. It's also a great tool to perform long-term shelf life stability studies at low temperatures. This webinar will offer insights into characterizing the stability of an engineered AAV serotype under moderate thermal stress and physiological solution conditions using light scattering measurements. In case we experience any technical difficulties, please be patient as it could take up to a couple of minutes to resolve the issue. Additionally, feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A and chat features located at the bottom of your screen. Today's present presenter is Professor Wayne Reed, and he is a co-founder and the scientific advisor to Yokogawa Fluence Analytics. Professor Reed is the Murchison Mallory Chair in Physics and the founding director of PolyRMC at Tulane University. He has authored more than 150 publications and is listed as inventor on more than 30 issued patents and patent applications, including all pertaining to ACOMP and Argen. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Reed. Welcome. All right, well, uh, thank you, Matt. Um, listeners might know that we have a hurricane coming on, so hopefully it'll be merciful and not spike to our um, So Matt has introduced the topic I'd like to first uh, make acknowledgments uh, for the financial support for this work from Spark Therapeutics uh, and uh, PolyRMC at Tulane. And, and the collaborators, uh, Professor Kurt Gerand, uh, did all of the light scattering measurements that we're about to see. And Dr. Matt Petroff uh, was the one who got this entire collaboration going it. And, and the uh, Spark Therapeutic portion of this, while Karen Baker uh, came data at Spark and me, Jing, uh, over, uh, took the overview of the entire uh, collaboration. Okay, so uh, as Matt mentioned, uh, I'm a physicist, not a molecular biologist or pharmaceutical scientist, so uh, I don't know a lot about uh, N associated viruses, so maybe these couple of uh, screens are more for me. But anyway, they can be used in a of context, you can see the list here. Uh, what we're uh, concerned with working with um, Spark was gene therapy. And here's a little uh, chat GBT uh, image of a the prosohedral type AV virus uh, with a DNA strand inside. So, uh, you know, uh, viruses are like little nanoscopic monsters. They know how to get into cells and how to inject the genome into them. So they're really ideal agents for uh, gene therapy where you have a, a new gene inserted into the genome, which is packet, packaged into the capsid, which knows how to get through the membrane, find the nucleus, and then inject the uh, DNA so it's uh, replicating with its uh, engineered gene. Um, we have other means of doing it is one of the top ones, but you see this other uh, virus used. And then there's also a, a lot of work in non-viral vectors, lipid nanoparticles, polymeric nanoparticles. Uh, but since we're concentrating on AAV, some of the advantages is uh, it's safety, it's not pathogenic. Um, you see the other advantages here. It's compatible with a wide variety of cells and tissues. 
and the DNA remains separate. That's interesting. It doesn't integrate into the host genome, and it's had some uh, clinical successes. Okay, so uh, now to the focus of this talk, which is using static and dynamic light scattering to measure uh, properties of these uh, capses, those that contain DNA and those that are empty. Uh, the static light scattering, uh, we're using this method, simultaneous multiple sample light scattering, uh, which is embodied in Arjun from Yokogawa. Uh, it has 16 uh, completely independent samples, so you can vary temperature stirring and, and other stressors uh, uh, and 16 uh, simultaneous experiments. And then on the dynamic light scattering side, we use the Brookhaven instruments BI-90. Okay, so the, the data in this webinar comes from an open access publication. Uh, it's the one we recently put out with, uh, again, uh, with Matt Petroff, the PI at, at Roche, and uh, the other collaborators, and Kurt Turan being the first author having produced this light scattering data. Uh, this came out in July of this year. Okay, I don't intend to give a light scattering lecture. Important always to know the methods you're using and what are the approximations and limitations. So this is just a little thumbnail uh, of light scattering. The, the simplest light scattering is when you have a particle very small compared to the wavelength of light. You know, we're using 660 nanometers. So anything that's maybe a 20th of that or below is fine. Certainly atmospheric molecules and the signal feature of that is if you have a uh, polarized light coming in, it's scattering it off a Rayleigh scatter, these small particles, it scatters equally in all directions. There's no angular dependence. So it suffices to make a single angle measurement. Uh, as the particles get larger, uh, the scattering starts to get greater in the forward direction and suppressed at higher angles. Uh, so forward means going this way, 90 degrees, which is a detection for both the Argent and for the Brookhaven DLS, uh, you can see that the larger particles are getting short shrift at 90 degrees. So you will underestimate the scattering of the larger particles at 90 degrees. Just that should be realized. And then when we're dealing with um, uh, colloidal particles like these virus particles, uh, when they start closer to the wavelength of light, they have very complex uh, scattering patterns. Um, the, the whole theory is developed by uh, a German physicist, me over hundred years ago, um, we don't need to get into it, but uh, our capsids, when they uh, aggregate far enough, we'll get into the V scattering domain. But we uh, make our measurements and, and take our uh, derivatives and such well before we get to that. Okay, the making molar mass measurements using static light scattering, extremely simple setup. You have a, a laser, we have it vertically polarized. So the electric field would be perpendicular to the screen. You have your scatterer, light scattered out to a detector at a certain angle. Theta zero is uh, the direction of the, the laser beam, 90 degrees perpendicular and 180 would be back scattered. Okay, so what we get by measuring the static lights and uh, calibrate it with Tyween, which is a pure solvent whose uh, scattering properties are, are very well known. Um, we talked about the Rayleigh scattering ratio. It's, you know, it's not really a ratio in the sense that it has units, which are one over centimeters. And for dilute non-interacting particles, for example, up in the atmosphere, um, small molecules, uh, O2, nitrogen, and so on, uh, have a certain number density. So the scattering is just proportional to that because they're not interacting. The polarizability is the polarizability of that for a given type of scatter will depend on the mass. The more mass, the more electrons, the more polarizable. This alpha is proportional to mass for a given type of scatter. It goes as that mass squared. If you look at uh, like a, a spheroidal solid scatter, that means uh, mass goes as R cubed. So alpha squared goes as R to the sixth, which is huge. It means that uh, one 10 micron dust particle approximately, will scatter like 10 to the 18th times one 10, 10 nanometer uh, protein. Uh, so you have to be very careful about uh, impurities like dust when you do this kind of scattering. Also notably, the uh, scattering, the Rayleigh ratio is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the incident wavelength. Uh, 
And that means shorter wavelengths scatter more. So, you know, you get a blue sky, blue uh, wavelength uh, in the 400 nanometers is a lot shorter than the red in the six, 700 nanometers. So you get somewhere on the uh, order of 10 times more scattering by blue than red, blue sky. And then uh, as at dusk or dawn, uh, the sunlight is coming through a thick layer of that thicker layer of atmosphere because they angle blue light scattering away and you see a reddish hue around the sun at dawn and dusk. Uh, so now um, we'll just state this here uh, under the right. Is you measure this Rayleigh ratio, you know the concentration of your uh, scattering solution in grams per centimeter cube. Uh, and K is this auxiliary constant, which there's a, a solvent index refraction well known. There's the wavelength dependence shown over here. Avogadro's number. So the only real auxiliary parameter that needs to be determined is the so-called dn by dc, uh, the optical contrast of scatter with whatever solution it's in. So that's measured independently, and it's always the same. So you see this m weight average molar mass, and that's what we'll get out of this. But like I said before, um, we want to be cognizant of the limitations and approximations being used. So briefly, I just want to uh, mention this, which is well, when you look at the, uh, the Zim equation, this is kind of like the workhorse in polymer characterization. Again, we're looking at that same KC over R, R being the scattering ratio that we measure. You see that it's one over MW. I truncated it to that in the last slide, but there's also an angular term, which accounts for size of the particle and a possible angular dependence we saw previously. And then there's an interaction term. So if, this term here is very small, and so and this one also small. Then we can legitimately claim this uh, relationship that Kc over R R being measured will give us the weight average molecular weight. Uh, so if we look at the this A two is the so called second variable coefficient. Uh, some pharmaceutical scientists and others will recognize it as B two two, but uh, it's very small for these uh, uh, viral capsids, and the concentration. When we were looking at the empty ones, was uh, like 20 micrograms per milliliter and eight micrograms per milliliter uh, for the full capsids. And so you can see this interaction term is like 0.016 percent for the uh, empty capsids, and it's even smaller at 0.04 percent for the full capsids. So the interaction term is negligible. Uh, if, now, when we look at the uh, angular term. Q is the uh, magnitude of the scattering vector. So the theta is our angle of observation, which for us and in the Argent and in the uh, Brookhaven DLS is stuck at 90 degrees. Uh, we know N lambda already introduced. So this is the Q vector value we're working with. So we have to multiply that squared by the, this is the mean squared radius of gyration. C average mean squared radius of gyration of a particle. So that product, which is dimensionless, needs to be a lot smaller than one if you're going to ignore this. And so when we put in for the capsids, we can see it's it's less than 1%. The DNA has got a bit more. It's still small, but it's, it's closer to 9%. So we have um, those approximations covered. And we should mention that as the particles get large, so we get into the me scattering. So if the particles were uh, growing at 90 degrees, you start to see these oscillations. Uh, at two equals zero, which eliminates the angular effects, you would see this. And you can see that uh, below of about 200 nanometers, they agree. So we're okay up to that size, considering that the um, unaggregated capsids are on the order of you know, 30 nanometers or so. Um, our angular independence is well warranted. And so what we do, um, we're looking in time um, at any particles. This happens to actually be a monoclonal antibody, which is aggregating. Um, what we look at is the early linear regime. You can see the time scale is about 15 minutes. Nice linear increase. What we see here is the weight, average molecular weight, divided by the initial mass, which if you have a good sample, it's the uh, native intact, uh, in this case, protein. Uh, and so we, if you take the slope, so that's dimensionless. So if you take the slope, we get what we call the aggregation rate. It's got um, units of inverse seconds, and it's just this, the time derivative of this uh, linear increase initially. Uh, it's robust, it's reproducible, it's interpretable in this case, called 0.005. Uh, 
that means you get a, a 0.5% increase in weight average mass uh, per second as this aggregation is occurring. Um, and another interesting property of the aggregation rate, we'll come back to toward the end, is that it's reciprocal is the time it takes for the sample to uh, arrive at weight average dimerization. So that's a nice benchmark, the reciprocal. Okay, so when we started with these um, AAVs uh, provided by uh, uh, Smart Therapeutics, uh, we measured the empty 3.4 to the sink, so you know, fairly hefty. There's an error bar, the full caps, as you expect, are, are more massive. And the DNA, we've got the sequence well known, so we know the mass from that. Okay, so that's our um, life scattering results on the mass. Now, uh, just to digress again, not a life scattering seminar, but uh, we do want to see uh, what we're actually measuring. So with dynamic light scattering, instead of measuring intensity, we're measuring intensity fluctuation. So the little thought experiment is, say you have one scatter here and another here, you have in-phase laser light coming in and then scattering, because they're at different distances from the detector, they'll arrive with different phase shifts. Yeah. Uh, so they produce an interference pattern. You know, it could be fully uh, constructive or fully destructive, but usually it wanders between those. Uh, and so what you have is kind of a uh, interference pattern as these particles diffuse about. Now you just put in a whole bunch of particles and you get the same effect. Uh, and that comes out when you're, you have a very small uh, scattering volume that you're sampling. And so when you look at the intensity, it looks kind of like noise. Uh, in fact, the average intensity is we measure with the static light scattering dynamic we're actually uh, measuring these fluctuations and uh, building what's called an autocorrelation function oh no hopefully we're okay i just got a message anyway um yeah so not to go into the autocorrelation integral uh but to mention that's what we get from uh, autocorrelating the these intensity fluctuations it turns out the electric field autocorrelation function to be an exponential like nature, uh, where that uh, decay constant is the fusion coefficient d times the q we've already talked about, q squared. Uh, and so if you have a very dilute solution where, there's, where the interactions are negligible, you get what's called the self-diffusion coefficient. In that case, you can use the uh, the workhorse Stokes-Einstein equation to relate hydrodynamic diameter, dH, to this measured uh, self-coefficient at very low constants. The other factors, of course, are Boltzmann's constant, case of B, temperature in Kelvin, solution viscosity um, in CGS units and in, in was. Okay, so that's if you have a nice monodispersed solution that's dilute, this is what you get. Uh, in reality, uh, which you're measuring, of course, is the fusion constant. And we um, go back to that decay rate, which is directly proportional to the fusion constant. That's what we're measuring. And when you have highly dispersed particles, you uh, get a Z average of that. We don't have to worry about the definition, but it's a, a Z average weighted toward large. So that's what the DLS is measuring. If you have a measuring Z average diffusion coefficient, you're not measuring hydrodynamic diameter. Um, but it, the, your software normally will report what it calls a hydrodynamic, uh, which is an apparent Z average hydrodynamic uh, diameter, which if you look at D sub Z, you're actually uh, measuring the Z average reciprocal hydrodynamic diameter. And so what you're screen showing you is actually the reciprocal of that Z average reciprocal. Uh, hydrodynamic diameter. That might sound esoteric, but it's not in reality. Um, here's what your system will report, um, and here's what the true Z average uh, hydrodynamic diameter is here. And you can see that because of what we mentioned earlier, small uh, the large particles scatter less at higher angles. You undercount large particles, and you can see that the apparent uh, Z average diameter you're getting from your software uh, is significantly underestimating the true value. Okay, that's a cautionary note. And what we're approximating here. Okay, now getting into the capsids. Um, this is very interesting. We were rather startled to see this. If we took the empty AAV capsids and we thermally stress them mildly 44 degrees, 
Here we are with MW over M0. We get this massive colloidal aggregation. See, it's happening very quickly. And then it looks like scattered data from there on out. Those are actually very large uh, the particles. These colloidal aggregates are so getting so large that they individually scatter light. And you can see them kind of like popping in and out of the scattering body. We get this immediate massive colloidal aggregation where the uh, capsid is empty. And then startling enough, if it's full, and by the way, we, we had 60% full in this study, so there's some empties mixed in. What you can see is that 44 degrees, the scatter actually goes down. Uh, and so we've linked this to, well, that's the uh, ejection of the DNA from the full AAV. It's coming out. You see it's fairly slow. That's 20,000 seconds. That's on the order of six hours to come completely out. And then subsequently, you can see there's some aggregation, but it's very low compared to this colloidal aggregation initially. It's, it's huge. Uh, so then if we do this at different temperatures and then look at that minimum, that's what we're saying is the point of full ejection of the DNA. You can see it follows the temperature dependence uh, quite clearly. Uh, the hotter it is, the more quickly it's fully released. Uh, and then we compare this to uh, our therapeutics uh, tighter method. Uh, that's in the red here, and black is from the light scatter. And you see they, they agree quite well. So we're confident in assigning this initial drop and minimum to the release of the DNA. Again, the, the minimum being the point of full DNA release from all the capsids. Uh, the, the aggregation rates that we find, both for the colloidal aggregation and for the DNA release, do follow uh, Arrhenius kinetics, which you might remember is some prefactor times exponential to the negative of the activation energy over RP, RB in the universe, S positive. So the slope, when you take the logarithm, the slope of this uh, is delta E divided by RT. So you can see in this table what we have, uh, the empty capsid. And, and this, this is beautiful. This kind of behavior with a kink in it for the caps is, is what we very typically see with proteins, including monoclonal antibodies, namely at low temperature, you have a steeper uh, 154 kcals per mole. There's kind of a break around maybe a regime, uh, and then it's, it sets off with a lower uh, activation energy of 50.8 kilocalories per mole. And in contrast, the uh, full caps is, is much lower. It's 27 kilocalories per mole. You see it here. Uh, it's in agreement with some um, uh, article we saw recently that measured this in a completely different way, the activation energy. Okay, so now if we com uh, compare the DLS behavior and the SLS behavior for the empty capsids, we see what you'd expect to see in colloidal aggregation, namely that as the aggregates grow in mass, which you're seeing in this blue here, on the right-hand scale, uh, the size is growing. So here's our apparent diameter that we just discussed, uh, growing in synchrony with the increase of the mass. So you'd expect that. Now, when you get to the full caps, it's, they actually go in opposite directions. So we're seeing what we saw before from the static light scattering, the decrease due to the release of the DNA. But the DNA, I mean, it's very tightly packed inside that capsid. That when it's released, it's able to, I'm not going to use the word unfold, but it does uh, stretch out as a stiffened random coil. And so its size is now greater than the capsid. And that's why as it's being released, the apparent hydrodynamic diameter goes up. Okay, very interesting contrast then between full and empty capsids from both dynamic and scattered, static life scattering. Okay, uh, boy. But now we want to just inquire a bit into the polydispersity, what's happening uh, in those two scenarios, the empty and full capsids. And now I regret putting this slide up. How about if we ignore all of this and just uh, condense it to, uh, you do an expansion of the logarithm of the correlation function, and you take the second term, uh, which measures the variance, and you, you divide it by the square of the first term. And if it were a, a perfectly monodispersed population, like the, um, say, uh, unaggregated capsid should be, or uh, a protein should be, then it would be zero. Uh, and getting to the bottom line, this index, which is dimensionless, uh, if you're under 0.1, that's considered by most to be low polydispersity, 0.1 to 0.3 is moderate, anything over 0.3 is, is quite high. 
So now when we look at the this polydispersity index for the uh, full capsid release of the DNA, we can see it's right around the, the good polydispersity range and maybe increases slightly because you're mixing some DNA in with the capsids, but it's still in the low to, to very low moderate uh, polydispersity, whereas the uh, empty capsids, you can see they start low, not bad uh, in this regime, but they quickly hike up in that initial massive uh, aggregation phase into the very highly polydispersed region. Okay, and that's what we expect with colloids. They just kind of randomly glom together, and that is not happening with the poles. So this is really kind of weird that we get such opposite behavior. And like I said, we were at 60% full caps. It's not 100%. So we thought, well, what would happen if we start... Um, mixing the full capsids with the empty ones, given that they have such radically different uh, behavior under this mild thermal stress, 44 degrees. Uh, so there's our, you know, 60% capsids doing what they've been doing since the first slide, going down to a minimum as they release DNA. But we can see when there's only 23% full capsids, that means, you know, 77% empties, you still get the DNA with no massive colloidal aggregation. And in fact, even at 20%, you're still getting some visible release, and then you finally overwhelm the um, the full capsids, and by 5%, 3%, you see you're back to colloidal aggregate. But that is remarkable that such a small fraction can have such a, an effect on the entire population, even when capsids, the empty capsids, are in a clear majority. Um, and if you take the, the initial slopes, remember that pollination rate, of course, for the uh, full capsids are negative, and, and the crossover point is right around 20% when you go from that positive um, colloidal aggregation to zero and then to the DNA release with a negative slope. So that's, uh, we'll come to this later, we we'll don't really have a good explanation for this, but as we repeated it many times, it, it works. Uh, now, if we look at the aggregation process, so we take the initial slope of the colloidal aggregation here, whereas for the full capsids, or the ones that were still behaving with, uh, like the full capsids with uh, noticeable DNA release, uh, you see this when they start to aggregate, the slope is way smaller than these. And in fact, if you plot the early positive phase, okay, so that's it's always positive now. Uh, versus the fraction of full capsids, you can see it spans orders of magnitude. And again, that's just by um, changing a relatively small amount of full capsids. So you know, we're, we're faced with this, this situation that a small capsid, relatively small, or 15, 20%, can uh, suppress the aggregation of capsids. Now, if there weren't an effect of these uh, of the DNA being released on the empty capsids, then we would expect, okay, empty capsids should be uh, colloidally aggregated and the full ones are releasing. And so we would simply have in the scattering a linear superposition. That would be this blue line here. You can see that's um, I over KC, so that's measuring the mass. Uh, it would go up very rapidly because of the, the massive colloidal aggregation from the overwhelming 70, 70% of empty capsids. And then after a while, it would start to come down due to the release. But in reality, it's nothing like that. It's not a superposition. Um, you still get seemingly full capsid-like appearance. Uh, so that's a puzzle. I'll, I'll give a tentative uh, conjecture at the end, but uh, leading up to, before we get to the end, uh, we also looked at the effect of DNA ACE on the release. And so you can see the two extremes once again, the 60% full capsid here and the empty capsid here. Uh, by increasing the dose of DNA ACE, we're bringing it more toward the empty capsid uh, colloidal behavior type of aggregation. So that suggests that as the DNA release, the DNA ACE is chewing it up and uh, inhibiting its ability or actually ruining its ability to prevent aggregation. So that, that makes sense. Somehow the DNA um, is inhibiting the aggregation, uh, and when you chew it up, uh, its ability to do that goes down. And you can see that the minimum 
here and the, the subsequent minima as you add in more enzyme, uh, they get shallower and shallower, of course. Okay, so now we're puzzled, you know, why and how can the release DNA uh, inhibit the aggregation of the empty capsids? Uh, so now we could have this picture in mind. So you got a bunch of these bits of DNA against a stiff and random coil, uh, and then you have the viral capsids mixed in there and say, okay, well, if you get that kind of a, uh, a reticulated network, that would certainly slow things down in terms of capsids diffusing and meeting each other. So if we look into that, um, here's the intrinsic viscosity, which by the way, is not a viscosity at all. It's by, better to have a volume per mass. So it's a, a misnomer, but it's used all the time. So forget about it. Um, it's uh, this constant phi, there's the molar mass, and there's the, again, the uh, mean squared radius of gyration of the particle. And so with the DNA in the coil limit, uh, we took the, I think it's, somewhere between 50 and 100 nanometer persistence length, L sub P, plug it in, you'll find that the, the root mean square radius of gyration is about 36 nanometers. And a, a handy thing about this intrinsic viscosity is that it's reciprocal, um, is a good approximation of the so-called overlap concentration. That's when the polymer solution is just concentrated enough that uh, the, the chains just start to overlap. And you'll see that for this type of DNA, it's 0 0.026 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, 26 grams per milliliter, and we're talking about eight microliters. So uh, our concentration of DNA is 18,000 times below the uh, overlap concentration. So we do not have any kind of reticulated system here. It's more of these isolated chains and isolated viral capsids moving around. Um, we're looking for a good explanation. Uh, here's a tentative one, starting here. So it's a conjecture. So first of all, we look at those dilute, uh, solutions, 2.6 times 10 to the 12 viral capsids per milliliter, which would give you the average spacing or mean free path of 720 nanometers between the capsids. Now, if you look at the diffusion coefficient of a 20 nanometer capsid, it's, it's this, 2.5, 10 to the minus 7 centimeters squared per second. Um, and if we use the diffusion equation, it tells us the average time to diffuse over a length L uh, is, is this, L squared over 6 times the diffusion coefficient. And so the time it takes for a uh, viral capsid to diffuse over this distance is 3.5 milliseconds, which means you could have 290 collisions per second between capsids. Uh, and now the, uh, no, that, sorry, that, that's the number of times you've diffused 720 nanometers. The number of collisions you'll make will be that frequency times six to account for uh, three axes plus or minus uh, times the uh, of the capsid over L, which is the uh, radius of that sphere. And so you get 0 0.084 diffusing gold collisions per second. Okay, now if we go back to what I mentioned earlier, which is that the aggregation rate, it's reciprocal, is the average time to dimerization. So two uh, AEV particles sticking together upon a diffusion controlled encounter, it takes 9,100 seconds to re reach weight average dimerization. So even though you have the 290, what do we have? Uh, no, sorry, 0.084 diffusion control collisions per second. It's saying that it would take, yeah, about 760 collisions uh, to get uh, a pair of capsids to stick together. That means uh, it's, it's highly improbable for two capsids to even stick together when they meet. It suggests that there's like some kind of sticky this on the surface and it has to be aligned just right so when the capsids hit they'll be able to stick uh, in that area um, so now what we're positing is that the uh, capsids make uh, elastic collisions with the dna they never stick to it they bounce off it uh, it's a conjecture uh, in that case the probability of sticking uh, of meeting a dna versus meeting uh, Capsid one capsid meeting a DNA versus a capsid meeting another is 22 times uh, greater. So that could explain why the uh, aggregation rate 
full capsids after release of the DNA uh, is slow. Remember, it doesn't stop, but it slows down a lot. So that's the best uh, we have to offer right now for a model. So if you find a better one, we'd love to hear it. I'm going to wrap up now. Um, what we've shown is that static light scattering is a efficient tool for monitoring the DNA release uh, and results agree with uh, the tighter methods. Uh, and then we showed that the full caps is at varying temperatures show uh, DNA release and, and very little, it's measurable, but small. Um, empty caps, it's at varying T, uh, are dramatically different than full caps. So we keep hammering that point. You get this uh, massive colloidal aggregation for empties and the DNA, DNA release released full. Uh, and that we saw that the DLS, that is the apparent hydrodynamic diameter, follows SLS for the colloidal aggregation, which is expected, uh, but goes opposite in the case of full capsids, uh, which the size goes up while the mass goes down, and uh, that we attributed to the DNA being released and, and you know, going into its native and random coil configuration, which is a lot bigger than the capsid. Uh, and then we had this surprising discovery that even small amounts of full capsids with the empty ones sharply lessen the colloidal aggregation. So I just showed a possible model, but we can't claim that we know, you know exactly what the, what the mechanism is. That, that's a, the elastic collision idea. Unfortunately, uh, of course, if we had some free DNA, uh, we would be able to test whether if he introduced it exogenously, that would have stabilized the capsid just as well as if it had been released from a capsid. So that's uh, a very important missing piece is simply because we didn't have the material uh, available. Um, and then we showed that when we use DNA, DNA ACE, it, it chews up the DNA. And so you lose some of that uh, inhibition of the colloidal aggregation. Again, uh, don't have a convincing model, unless you were convinced by the one I just gave about the elastic collisions, uh, it's plausible. Um, and then I really should point out that, uh, you know, this was restricted to um, actually the two types of AAV from Spark, uh, but there's a wide variety of AAV and we're not claiming that they would all behave just like this. Uh, that's you know, a question for further experimentation with a wider variety of AAV capsids. Um, I will mention that um, at uh, Agathis, uh, they, they produce AAV capsids. They uh, sent us some samples recently. Uh, we haven't uh, collected all the data, data together yet, but we are seeing the DNA release. They sent us full capsids, so we can't see if the empty capsids would behave the same, but the full ones are following this, so we're, we're seeing and measuring the uh, release time. Uh, okay, well, I think that's all I have to say, and I appreciate your attending, and uh, if there's any questions, I think we could do that now. Thanks again. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Reed. We do have a few questions, and to all the, the attendees, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A or the chat features. The first question, Professor Reed, did you experiment with intermediate capsids? I'm not and sure what an inter. But was it a follow up to that? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and then the follow up says, "Would it be possible to know about impurities if the cap in the capsid structures using light scattering?" Yeah, I'm not sure what what they mean by intermediate capsids because I'm by no means an expert in AAV. Um, that's an intriguing question. I, I I don't know the answer. If there were impurities, would that change these aggregation profiles? Um, I guess one way we do it would take AAVs and deliberately introduce impurities, or if they were saying they're intermediate AAV because cells have irregularities or impurities in the capsid structure, um, then if we could get those, we could certainly test. Uh, we don't know what the answer would be. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay. And Nadia, um, if you had follow-ups to that, just drop it in the Q&A again. Um, the next question, Professor Reed, what led you to use the 44 degree temperature um, since it's higher than the body temperature? Okay, that's good. First, I, uh, Nadia, to the bank, bon dia. <laughs> um, 44 degrees, we chose that uh, simply because uh, it was a handy temperature results 
period of hours rather than um, waiting days if we'd gone below two guess aggregation was but kind of painfully slow. So it was just a means of speeding it up uh, so we could do more experiments and gather more data. Okay. Um, next question, did you do any studies at 37 degrees? We did. Um, I, think I showed some of the release data um, when we compared it to the tighter method. I think it was at 38. So yeah, there was there were measurements below 40 in the pharmaceutical regime. Uh, again, they were very slow. That's why we, we did most of the work at the, the slightly elevated temperature to uh, get quicker results and more of them. Okay. Um, this, the next question says, did you try to add extraneous DNA to em empty capsids? Okay, well, that, of course, is a fantastic question. Uh, I did address it in the conclusions, namely, we did not have any exogenous DNA, quite unfortunately, to test that. That's, that's a key test. So that's a question mark um, pending getting uh, the DNA uh, free from the capsid and being able to introduce it exogenously. We'd love to do it. Okay. Um, so feel free to reach out to Professor Reed or us uh, following the webinar, Samuel. Next question, Professor Reed, is it possible to analyze with light scattering the interaction of plasmid DNA with liposomes or nanoparticles? considering that the plasmid has a spheral format. Well, I mean, if it interacts, we're going to see something in the light scattering, you know, depending on the nature of the interaction. Um, if there's actual association, of course, you'll see it uh, right away. Or if one leads to the degradation of the other, you would see that. Um, if, it's, if they don't stick or degrade or influence each other, um, depending on the concentration, we can see there uh, virial coefficient effects on each other. So again, great question. The, the, the proof of the uh, pudding is in the experiment. Okay. The next question, and, and this is our last question, Professor Reed. Um, if you have any final questions, please drop them in the Q&A or chat feature. Do you think the charge-charge interactions may play a role in stabilizing the empty capsids considering that DNA is negatively charged? And, and there's a follow-up, do the empty capsids have a charge? Um, frankly, we don't know, at least I don't know. Uh, maybe Matt Petroff and his colleagues would have a better idea of the isoelectric points of the proteins and what the charge state is. Um, th th there's a lot of complex things clearly happening with charge because the DNA is negative and the capsid has a positive and you're stuffing it into the, uh, condensing the DNA down into the center of the capsid. Uh, so there is a lot of charge-charge interactions going on. Um, yeah, beyond that, I can't really say. That's that's a, a very, could be a very fruitful line of inquiry. In fact, what I'm getting from all these questions is that almost each one of them uh, is suggesting a, a series of experiments to find the answer. So I think that's where we're at. Uh, I'm an experimentalist. So I believe in doing the experiments and finding out what's actually going on. And what's been mentioned so far would be really wonderful things to try. Thank you. All right. Well, Professor Reed, we really appreciate your time today um, and all of this information in the webinar. Um, to everyone who attended, we really thank you for taking time out of your busy day to tune in with us. Uh, we will send out the recording of this webinar uh, in a few days. Please share it with any of your colleagues who may be interested. We're happy to speak to you about all of your applications and to see if Arjun is a good fit for your team. Um, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day, and we are very grateful that you joined us. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now.